I'm always amazed how God works. The uh, lesson this morning on the conversion class, uh, class was knowing that you're in Christ and being saved and having that assurance that once we've been regenerated by the Spirit, we know that God is, is going to take us from wherever we are today to the final destiny, which either is his return or he takes us home. And it's amazing to me how the Holy Spirit just threads the needle, uh, not even talking, not even knowing actually what Pastor Chris was going to bring to our attention today in the conversion class, because there is no chapter uh, 8. There was just a conclusion that we went through, and it was a Q&A amongst our membership, which was vibrant, uh, the Spirit speaking to us. And here now the Holy Spirit is going to build this thread to us in a sense of that we are called to be witnesses, that we have been chosen by God, and the Spirit is the seal of the covenant within our lives. It's amazing how God orchestrates all this. Now, as you know, context is extremely important to whatever scripture you're going to read. And so I want to put the, the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Spirit, which was both visible and invisible, evidence that God was among his people in proper context before I read to you the actual verses. I will refer you to Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21, as the starting point for the context of this message. Okay, again, I'm just laying out before you uh, the outpouring of the Spirit in a contextual manner before we get to this particular portion of Scripture. Most of you are very familiar with this. It says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Peter's words earlier in the book of Acts. And he, his sermon was declaring a uh, fulfillment of Joel the prophet. That's where that particular text comes from that there would be this outpouring of the Spirit in the last days. And the last days began with the resurrection of Christ. We are in the last days now, and the Spirit is still active today. Even though some of us may question what God is up to, it seems like as if he's silent, I can assure you that the Spirit of God is actively involved in the affairs of man. And especially, he's involved with those that know him and are called by his name. So the contextual evidence of the Spirit going forth, these are the last days, amen? We're in the last days. The evidence of the Spirit going forth is, is really important, so I want to show you uh, what did the outpouring of the Spirit actually mean? What was it all about? Well, the first is, is that the Spirit is being poured out upon all flesh, and that I'm going to speak to about regeneration. That is, man is being regenerated. In other words, he was lost, dead in sin, and the Spirit of God now makes him alive. That's a work of the Spirit. It's not intellectual gymnastics that you do. It's not one day you saying, oh, I think I'm in Christ. No. If you're in Christ, it's because the Spirit of God has regenerated you from a dead man to a man that's alive now. Amen? And here's Here's the text for that, if you just, very quickly, in Titus 3, 5 through 7. He saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Thanks be to God for that. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God that God is merciful. Man, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. As that being justified, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's one aspect of the Spirit being poured out, one of many. The second aspect of the outpouring of the Spirit could be found in signs and wonders. Acts 14.3. 
It says, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Aren't you grateful that God is still active in the world today? I'm not a sensationalist. I don't believe that spiritual gifts ended in the first century. I believe that God is actively working today in his church, and he still performs miracles today to God be the glory. Signs and wonders follow those who believe and trust in him. There's cosmic events going on. Boy, we can say yes and amen to this. Everyone in this room probably remembers where they were this week when the ground began to shake. Well, some of you say, I didn't feel the ground shaking. Well, how many of you felt the ground shaking? All right. Some of you on vacation, that's right, you didn't have no ground shaking. You just had a lot of sunshine where you were, brother. You can bring some of that back here. But the ground shook, and we, all re we, we can recall where we were when the ground was shaking. You know, the Bible says that as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ, that these events will become more frequently, and they will happen in, in such a way as I believe that God is trying to get the attention of mankind. But listen to what Luke 23, 44 through 45 says. Luke 23, 44 through 45. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. That was a cosmic event at the death of Christ between the sixth and ninth hour. His last breath, you know what happened in the temple? The curtain was torn in two, and now we have a mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cosmic events. But don't limit those cosmic events just to that, because as I said earlier, there'll be earthquakes and famines in various places. These are all the beginning signs of what the Bible says are birth pains, until finally the Lord returns. And then there's this event, the outpouring of the Spirit will happen on the day of the Lord. Look at Luke 21, verse 22 through 24. For these days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written, alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, you look at this, and some people will say, well, this already occurred in A.D. 70, and that could very well be true. But this is also looking ahead. All of the prophecy in Luke, uh, in, the, uh, in that chapter, in Matthew 24, goes back and forward in the events that are going to take place. We know that this world is becoming a more difficult place to live in. We know things are not getting better, but they're actually getting worse. Jesus said that this would happen prior to his return, that the world would be chaotic. There would be lawlessness. Men will be lovers of self, uh, Peter talks about in his epistle. So we should understand that the outpouring of the Spirit is in line with God bringing about the day of the Lord. Aren't you grateful for that? The day of the Lord will come. It says here in uh, Luke, and just uh, probably for our own information, it says, for these are days of vengeance. These are days of vengeance. Who's God angry at? He's certainly not angry at his beloved, he's not angry at his church, but he's angry about sin. This, this wrath will come because of God's vengeance, his righteous anger. Consider with me uh, this text, it's not on the overhead, but Isaiah 35, 4 says, 4 says, Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Your God will, those that are here going through this difficult time, the Holy Spirit wants to remind you, fear not. Fear not, because God is in control. Fear not. He'll bring vengeance, but he'll see us through whatever situation and circumstance that we must go through as individuals or a corporate body of Christ. To God be the glory. That verse ends in verse 4 with, with this, these words. He will come and he will save you. In other words, as difficult as it may be, God has a timetable when he's going to return orchestrated by the Spirit, and he will save you, he will save me, to God be the glory. And finally, the Spirit is talking about salvation for all people. Remember, Peter had the vision, 
He was in a trance. He went outside. He sees all these foods, and he tells the Lord, ah, I'm never going to eat those. I'm good. God says, don't you dare call uh, things unclean that I've made holy. And the work of the Spirit in these last days is that God will no longer show partiality to anyone. Aren't you grateful for that? Remember what Peter finally came to the conclusion? And remember, he was a good old Jewish boy. He was holding down all of the laws. He was walking in obedience to Judaism. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, says the following. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Hallelujah. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And again, the Spirit is setting the groundwork for the Gentiles coming in to the fold. No partiality means Jews and Gentiles need the saving grace of a Redeemer, and you can't get to him any other way but through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now to three points of our text this morning. That's the contextual evidence. Here's the three points. Number one, a witness to the things he has done. Number two, chosen by God. And number three, the Spirit was a gift promised to covenant people. That's all found in, in this particular portion of Scripture that we're going to look at. Can I get a little bit of water up here, please? Uh, thanks. My throat's just a little bit uh, a little dry this morning. So let's look at our text now. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. A witness to the things he has done. That's what, that's what we're called to be, brothers and sisters. A, a witness to the things that he has done. Right? And, and let me just say this. It, and, and the Lord reminded me of this as I was studying. Sometimes our witness is more about us than it is about him. Thank you, sir. Have you ever heard some testimonies that people give? There's an ounce of Jesus in it, but there's 99 ounces of self in it. We, we really need to be careful because in this context, a witness to the things that he has done, there's listed here some of the things that he's done that we need to be a witness to. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should not give our testimony or give God the glory for some of the things that happened in our lives. But that can't be the way that we are a witness to people all the time. There's something greater than what he's done for you and what he's done for me in the context of, wow, the Lord really showed up in this circumstance. And this text here is going gonna, is gonna to kind of put it in order for us. So here it goes. Acts chapter 10, verse 39 through 43. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to those who he had chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he was rose from the dead. Let me just stop there. So what are the, some of the things that he did, according to this text? What did he do? He went to where? He went to the cross. He died. He was raised again. He had communion with them. You following? See, so, so what Peter's saying is, is, is in being a witness that we must testify to these pillars of the faith, that Christ died for our sins. He redeemed us. He made us new people in him. Amen. He was resurrected from the grave. He overcame the greatest enemy that any of us ever will come in contact with, and that is death itself. He overcame that by raising on the third day testifying to these things, that's what he's saying, uh, that he, uh, not only that, uh, that, that he did these things, but we know in the gospel message that Jesus healed those oppressed by the devil, to God be the glory. It's an ongoing ministry of Christ the Messiah. He's not only overcome death in the grave, but he overcomes everything that opposes him. If God chose to uh, come against Satan's uh, schemes at any moment, at any given time, he could, because he's God. God has no equal, brethren. There's no one equal to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is superior to all things. In him, all things he holds together. He's not subjected to anything except his Father, and he always does the will of the Father. 
it's important to understand this. These are the things that they are uh, to recall. What were some of the things he did? He did these things. Now, Peter here assumes that most of the people in the surrounding area heard about Jesus of Nazareth because this event was not done in secrecy. I mean, he was the talk of the town, so to speak, and even being the talk of the town. Remember when some of the disciples showed up and walked with him? They didn't recognize him. The talk of the town, and that just indicates to us that this witness has to be embedded in being chosen by God and regenerated by the Spirit. It's not just anybody. There's some people that don't, they're not even in Christ and they're trying to be a witness for them. And that goes so far. It's just like what I would call a conversation with somebody, but it, it has no teeth to it. Why? Because there has to be the spirit behind your witness. There has to be evidence that we have been chosen by God, that we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. You see, the witness was always about Jesus and what he did and what he said. Being this witness is what you and I are called to be. Well, how do we do this? What's the evidence for being a witness in Christ? Well, this is not uh, in your overhead, but I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. You're called to be a witness. I'm called to be a witness. Amen. Second Corinthians five, eighteen through twenty. This is a this is what a witness looks like and acts like. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And all this is from who? And all this is from God. All this is from God, who through Christ Jesus reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, some people are looking for titles, positions, and ministries. What's the ministry according to Corinthians? The ministry that everybody has in this room is to bring reconciliation from the world back to God. You following me? In other words, we are his witnesses. We are testifying about what Jesus has done historically and also what he's done in our lives. It's okay to bring your testimony in there, but let's get the order of priority in place. It, we can talk about his death, his burial, his resurrection. We can bring people to the scripture that says man is lost and dying without Christ and needs a savior. That's what being a witness is all about, and no one is exempt from that. You see, when we are in Christ, we have been reconciled back to God. But, but are you following me? Do you know what that means? It means that you have been forgiven of your sins. I have been forgiven of my sins. The sins that I did before, the, things, the sins that I'm doing now, and even the sins that are being done in the future, God knows what they'll be. But I am forgiven. You are forgiven because of the work of Christ. That's extremely important. Because you can't reconcile someone to Christ if you have not been reconciled yourself. It, you know, it just becomes a conversation, and then, then they look at us, and then they watch us for a while. And that's why you need the rest of this verse to understand what this means to be a witness for Christ. Look at what it says. Verse 19. That is, in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trans passes against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You, you are sent to the nations. You are sent out of your comfort zone. You are an ambassador to Christ. God making his appeal through who? Is that possible? What does that mean that God is making his appeal through us? It means that God is seeing the Son through the witness of those who know Christ and have been reconciled back to God. Could you imagine such a thing? That the, the, the world sees Christ through the life of a believer. 
I could only ask the Lord to help me, Lord Jesus, with that. What about you? And, and, and the way in the age that we're living in, brothers and sisters, on how the world is going to see Jesus is by how we respond to the things that are going on in this world. How do we respond to pain? How do we respond to brokenness? How do we respond to earthquakes? How do we respond to the things that we don't understand are going on? How, what is our response? You see, if our response is, is just like theirs, if our response is to go to the martini or to go to the drug or to go through the world system to get relief, then we've lost our witness and our credibility. But if our response is to go to our Father and humble ourselves before him and say, Lord, I don't understand these things, but I am your witness because you have called me. And I'm going to be faithful to you, Lord, because you're, you've been faithful to me. You know, I'll put it to you this way. How important is it to have a father figure in the home? How, how, what, does, what does a father figure bring to the family? That father figure brings security to the family. That father figure brings a sense of, of, of purpose to the family. You watch young children that has a, a father that, that loves Jesus with everything. You watch how they, how they look at him, how, how they, 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 they look at the expressions that he's, that he's making as they go through the circumstances of life, how they pick up on things, children, very quickly by their father's presence. And then, you know, like myself and some of you, you never had that witness in your life. And so you, you had to play catch up then. You had to, this is what you had to do, tell me not. You had to go to your heavenly father. You had to look upward and say, I didn't have an earthly father that showed me the way. So I go to my heavenly father. My heavenly father is merciful to me, amen? And he changes that father. The father of all fathers changes that earthly father. Little by little, he begins to just crack off the hardness and the edges around him. And that person who was so rough and tough becomes nothing more than a, a, a little usable tool in the hands of the father of all fathers. And that father is able to bring reconciliation to his home. You know, when the home is broken, it, it rests on that father being sensitive to the Lord, right? Right? And, and, and being that merciful uh, agent of God's redemptiveness to that home. And, 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 and fathers, you know this as well as I know. You might have kids that are broken, that aren't serving the Lord today. It's your response to them that matters now. It's how well you're loving. It's how well you're going about your daily business that speaks more volumes to your children. Because remember... Remember, in all of the Bible verses that you give them, which is good and which is needed, at the end of the day, your kids and my kids are watching our every move and listening to our words. And if we want our children to be won over to Christ, then they have to see that we're walking in Christ. They need to see it. They need to see that our appeal to them is not so much our words, but it's our actions. And our actions say, I am an agent of reconciliation to my family, and therefore, children, follow me. Forgive me for missing the mark all those many years, but follow me now. And I will tell you, to God be the glory, he will do it. That witness to our children, to the world, Christ makes his appeal through us. I, I can only say that I'm making people jealous of my walk with God. I don't know. Maybe I've thrown off the aroma to some people. They say, well, that's the reason why I won't become a Christian. Now, I, I hope that's not true. And if I've done that, I've asked forgiveness from the Lord. What about you? But we have, to, we have to take that posture because you're called to be a witness, man. I'm called to be a witness. Like there's a responsibility with that. And, 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 and brothers and sisters, I, I don't, I'm not coming at you from a negative way, but I'm just saying this, that if we spent more time and effort in being a witness for Christ, we probably spend less time doing things that disqualify us from being a true witness. That's how God works. Second point of this text, look at verse 41 with me. Point two is chosen by God. 
and I, I want this to sink in for you today, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. What does it mean to be chosen by God? How does being chosen by God affect our identity and our mission in life? These are the questions that you have to ask yourself. The scripture here makes it very clear that your witness came about because God decided to call you to make you a witness. Now, when you consider John 15, verse 16, I don't know what you do with that except read it at face value. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. See... I'm just not called because one day I woke up and I said, I think I'm going to try out the pastorate. That would have been in itself a miracle for me because I never spoke in front of people. I didn't read. I, this guy's going to speak in front of people. <laughs> no, no. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a pastor. And you didn't wake up one morning and say you were going to be a Christian. You see, the father of all fathers, the loving heavenly father who created everything from nothing said, that's my servant. That's the one I'm calling. He is the one. She's the one that I'm going to call to be a witness for me. Oh, glory be to God. I don't know about you, but knowing that your father is the one that called you and has equipped you and has assigned you to something, allows me to wake up every single morning that God has put life in this body to say, this is not my day, Lord. This is your day because you have called me and because you've called me to bring glory to yourself. Amen. It changes the whole game, brethren. It's not an accident. God doesn't do accidents and God doesn't respond because he has to. Before the foundations of the world, he saw you in your mother's womb and set you apart for his purposes to God be the glory. There is no higher calling than that. And when you understand that, it changes everything. Because God doesn't start something and then takes his hands off and says, I, I don't know how to complete this. What he begins, he will complete in you and in me. Amen? Amen. He, he, he just doesn't, like, take his hands off us. Brothers and sisters, even when, look, this is what I know about the Lord. Even when we're not feeling him, that doesn't mean that he's not there for us. Listen to what Scripture says. Just don't say that Pastor Dan said this. Listen to what Scripture says in Ephesians 1. And uh, I know it starts with verse 11. Just keep the verse up there for one moment. But when you read Ephesians 1, and you understand how many times the term in him is used, you begin to understand that Jesus is doing all of this. L let me just read you verse 4 and onward, and then we'll get to that text. Even as... He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And I think you guys talked about that in your conversion class at the very end of the conversion class today. You know, what kind of people are we to be? Holy people. Because God has called us to be. Because God has given us his spirit so that we will become what he wants us to be. Are you following with me? He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purposes of his will. Now, wait a second here. What is that saying to you and I? That God chose us before the foundations of the earth, predestined us for the purposes of whose will? 
His will. Is there anything more powerful than the will of God? Is there any human will that can thwart the will of God? No. He chose us for his will, for his purposes. He called us. Now, it says, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through the blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will. What an incredible portion of text here. The mysteries of his will. Some people says, I don't know what the will of God is. I want to tell you what the will of God is for you. You want to know what it is? What's the will of God for every Christian in here? What's the will of God? Tell me what the will of God is for you. What is it? What is it? Yeah. Worship, glorify him, walk with him, become obedient to his ways, right? That's the will of God for you. Like people chase their whole life. I don't know what the will of God is. It's like it's in a location somewhere. No, no. The will of God is not a location. It's not a destination. The will of God is what's happening right here. Are you in alignment with Christ? I want to do the will of God. The will of God is to glorify God. Are you glorifying God in your life? You see that? Brothers and sisters, this may seem very elementary to you, but for too long we've missed the mark. We found the will of God of being a location or something that God has called us to do. The will of God for you. And here's the beauty, oh, brothers and sisters. When you are in Christ, he moves you to do what he desires you to do. This wrestling match is because you haven't let go yet. The wrestling match that so many believers have is a wrestling match of control. Well, what the heck are you in control of anyway? You don't even know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. So why don't we just relinquish that and say, God, to God be the glory. I am chosen by him to do the will of God. This is the whole backdrop for Peter. It's a revelation to him. Like, there's no accidents in this. It's like there's no mistakes in this. Like, you, you say you have no self-esteem. You know where, where your self-esteem goes when you know you've been called by him? I mean, who's higher than God? Who's superior to God? Yo, man, it's a game changer. Like, I, I, and I know that maybe this may seem Chinese to you, or maybe you just heard it all before, and maybe the Spirit has to do something to you. I, I, I kind of get it. But I, I just want to tell you that when, when you understand your calling, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. It doesn't matter how you're treated. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You've been called by God. And that's the most highest calling any individual can ever have. And the scripture says that he determined that. What an amazing God we serve. Can we give him a hand of praise? He's an amazing God. <laughs> Listen to what the text says now. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Yo, you're not an accident. The things that are happening in your life are not to destroy your faith. This is what this text tells me. If you're in Christ, these things are happening because he's conforming you to his will. Don't mix up the potter and the clay, please. We're but clay in the hands of God. Did you know that? Who's the potter? God. And he's molding us into his images, his conformality, the way he so chooses to do so. And I want to tell you, it's uncomfortable as heck sometimes. And it hurts. And you question. But nonetheless, God is in control because he's called us. Amen. It says, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Do you see that? It's all for the glory of God. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are Christ or who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The, the Holy Spirit comes, regenerates, seals us in God. What's, the, what's that little voice inside of you that says, come on, keep going, trust the Lord? 
That's the Spirit of God. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it within you. In Him. In Him. Praise be to God. It says in our text, now main text, Cookie, I know I'm giving you a workout this morning. Acts 10, 42 and 43. Yes, we're back to Acts. That's the main text. <laughs> and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of their sins through his name. Let me see what I want to pick and choose for you this morning here. Hmm. Appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. I think that's important. Why is it important? Why is it important that God is the judge of the living and the dead? What happens at the end of the age, brethren? What happens when Christ returns? There's going to be a resurrection. Amen? And if God is just the God of the dead, that he doesn't serve us any hope for the resurrection... But if he's just the God of the living, then what happens to the dead? The Bible says that he's going to judge both the living and the dead. Listen to what 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. You see, what, what, what this text is, is telling me is that the gospel must be preached with urgency because Christ is going to come, and we don't know the exact hour when he's going to come. But being a witness and being called by God will drive us to proclaim the good news to everybody that we come in contact with. Because the reality is this, brothers and sisters, the Bible is very clear. Those who don't give their heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be eternally condemned forever and ever and ever. And that's what moves us. We don't know who God is going to save. We don't know uh, who is going to say yes to the gospel message. But we do know, we do know that we're called to proclaim. It's an urgency that I think we've lost. It's easy to be caught up with just our own little lives at times and the little things that are going on in our lives and we've just lost sight of the bigger message. You understand what this means? Which, brother, I don't even understand it sometimes, but this is eternity. Can you even fathom that? I, I, have, a, I have a problem fathoming that. Eternity? I mean, all I've known is space and time my entire life. Right? So like, this is a concept that like eternity, like, you know, uh, what does that mean? Forever? You, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, like that's, that's a long, I can't even say it. That's more than a time. I mean, that's eternity. For all eternity. You know, this is why, like, like, understand that we're called to be a witness. Understand that we have been chosen by God. The urgency it, 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 it is, is before us to proclaim the gospel. And this is not just for Timothy, folks. I read you that verse in Corinthians. It says that we make our appeal to the world through the way that we live. You know, living that way is proclaiming the gospel. But it's not just limited to that. It's also the preaching of the word. And as time goes on, brothers and sisters, as time moves on, as, as, as things move on in this world, the message of the cross is not going to be embraced 
it's going to be, be uh, it's going to be a, a, a gesture. The world is going to just put both hands out and say, "Stop, you intolerant bigot! Stop!" Religion is the cause for all of the problems that we have, and they're going to go to they're going to go to the world religions. Trust me on this. They're going to look at the Islamic religion, Judaism, and Christianity, and they're going to say, "Look at all of your beliefs that you'll take to your grave." has been the, the reason why humanity has fought and the reason why there's been blood spilt on the ground. And there, there will come in our day a hatred. There's already anti-Semitism raising its head in, in volumes here. Who's going, who's going to be the friend of the Jew? Tell me. Tell me who's, it's going to be the Christian. It's going to be the Christian, right? And so when you put those two together, those Christians and those Jews are problems. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that what I'm saying now, uh, the way I'm preaching now, what, what I'm saying from this pulpit now, in a few years from now may not be tolerable. They might, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, they, they, they uh, take notice of everything. You know, these platforms that we're on, they listen to what's being said. They can just turn it off. They can turn it off. They can close your mouth in a second. What's going to happen then? Are we, are we going to are we going to whine and cry and say, "Oh, it's not fair what God is doing"? No, no. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. The Spirit of God is going to rest on, on on the believer and say, "You know what? I'll do what I need to do." Because I'm going to bring glory to God. And if I bring glory to God with being persecuted, then so be it. Let it be persecution. Let it come. But for, 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 the, for the nominal believer, or for the believer that really hasn't settled his feet in the gospel, there's one or two things you do. Either God finally gets a hold of your attention and you just come full circle to him and lay down, or you become very critical and cynical. I think like we're at those stages, brothers and sisters, please hear me today, please. I, I, this is not a scare tactic. It, I just feel that we're living in a time now that's different from any other time. This is a different season that we're in. A different season that we're in. And preaching the word is going to have consequences attached to it. But we know that preaching the word will eventually bring back the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Oh, Lord, help us. Amen. I, I, I think about Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Well, here the Gentiles are receiving the gospel. Verse 44 through 48 of our main text, please, point three, the Spirit was a gift promised to covenant people. And I, I wish we had more time to develop this, but I'm, I'm not going to develop it fully because you've been gracious already. And I don't know if I have the faith that Paul had that when someone fell out of the, the, uh, the apartment and died that he went down and raised them to life again if you fall asleep. I don't know if I have that anointing on me, so... Give it a shot. Well, if you fell out of your seat, nothing would happen anyway, right? The Spirit was a, a, a promise to the covenant people. It says, when Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Well, let's stop right there. The same Spirit that fell upon the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember the story? He traveled thousands of miles to come. The centurion, remember the centurion? The same spirit that fell upon the centurion. 
the same spirit that fell upon those Jewish nice boys that were having the Passover because God said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon you, fell upon them. That same spirit now that, that rose Christ Jesus from the dead, that same spirit now falls on the Gentiles. And Peter and all the Jews are saying, what is going on here? How could this possibly be? Just like God. Just like God, just like God who takes the things that are, are looked upon as despised, the things that are, are less polished, and, and, and he pours his spirit upon them. And how, how did they know that the spirit fell? Because they spoke in tongues. That's how they knew that the spirit fell. Those Gentiles were speaking in a tongue that was common to the Jews, and the Jews says, they're praising God. How could this be? Peter is going back in his mind saying, wait a second, I remember that vision that I saw there, that food, don't, don't say what's clean is unholy. Uh, I remember that God is not partial to anybody, and the Spirit's going to quicken Peter to say, accept them. And you and I sit in this church today as a result of the great salvation of Christ coming to us as Gentiles. And the question was this, would God pour out his spirit on those who are unconverted or uncircumcised? But what will we do with that? God would quickly remind them, the Jewish people, and he will do so at a council later on in the book of Acts, that it's not about an outward circumcision that God's wanting you to uphold, even though the Jewish people and the Jewish converts would eventually say to the Gentiles, you're not a real believer until you've been circumcised in the flesh. The Spirit knew better. Ezekiel 37 and 14 says, and I will pour out my Spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do all these things. In other words, God's spirit being poured out was a spirit poured out in the inward heart of a man, not with the evidence of just some circumcision, but it was an inward change that the Lord was speaking about. Romans 3, 2, uh, Romans 2, 28 through 29 makes this very clear to us. Those that were circumcised were amazed that the spirit fell. But Paul would later write these words, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outward, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And this is what God did in that moment of time. He said, Now the covenant promise of the Spirit is within the hearts of people. To God be the glory. In Galatians 3.14, the Bible says the following. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. By faith, through the spirit, a Gentile is saved the same way a Jew is saved. And this is what's happening in this context. And then Peter says, oh, can anybody withhold water from us? Let's water baptize them. And again, a sign that they've been grafted into the vine, and now the church is going to expand phenomenally to a Gentile audience. And, uh, and almost to a default, in, in our current contemporary situation, some people believe that you know the church replaced Israel and the Jews, and we don't believe in replacement theology here. We believe that we are part of the covenant people of God, both Jew and Gentile. And the church will have its purpose in the last days to be a great witness to the Jews who will one day return back to their Messiah. Amen? Because right now, let's face it, when, you know, we, and, and, and I, I'm going to close with this thought, and it's a little bit off, but maybe just food for thought for some of you. It's really, you know, when we say, the, the Bible tells us that those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. I understand that. But I try to put that in its context as well. We know that right now, most of Israel is not living for Yeshua, right? They're not. They're very, it's a secular nation. But we also know as believers that that piece of geography land there is very important to the end times. And so even though they may not be living for God, we know that supporting Israel in our prayers 
in our finances is a way of saying, God, you're going to use this land to bring back your people one day, and we want to be a little bit a part of this. That's why we do what we do. We don't, and it, but we don't say that th this is a, a nation that's fearing God right now because they're, they're outside of the will of God right now, the Jewish people. They've not come to the Messiah. Yeah, but we do hope and pray that one day they will. Amen? And this church in particular, living in this particular area of North Jersey, I think is going to have a lot of opportunity uh, to share Christ uh, and uh, with those that are around us. So praise God. This is the word of God. This is his word this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask that our ushers would come forward here in a moment. We're going to take a, a well, actually, we're going to do communion now. I'm sorry. Let's do communion first. Praise God. Communion table. It's open to those who are in Christ Jesus. You should have already received the emblems. If not, you can just raise up your hand and we'll, we'll get them to you. And once you have them, would you please stand? I'll let I'll them know you're ready to partake. And you know, we do believe there's healing in the atonement. We do. I, I believe God still heals people today. And uh, let, let this be uh, food for our soul and also let it be nourishment uh, for our bodies. Amen. The scripture says the following. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Amen, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming. Let's take. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, those that have partaken communion declare to each other that we are in Christ, that the Spirit lives within us, that we have communion with you and we have communion with each other. So, Lord, be glorified in this church. Speak to us, Lord, as members, as adherents of this church, Lord, and do what only you can do, Lord, within our lives. And let us remember that we've been called to bring glory to your name. In everything that we do, may we bring glory to your name. Seal it with the Spirit now, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name and for his glory and honor, amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. You can give him praise. Amen. I'm going to ask that our ushers would come forward. Uh, you can be seated. We're going to take up our tithes and offering before the Lord today. And then uh, Sister Sally has announcements for us. Amen. You got double duties here. He's got single duties. All right, here. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's pray to, for the offering that we're about to collect. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. Thank you for the for the provisions that you've given us, Lord, for our jobs, for everything, Lord, that I, the blessings that we have, Lord. We pray for your offering that we are about to collect, Lord. We pray that you multiply it, Lord, that you bless the givers, Lord, the ones that can give, the ones that can give, Lord. Bless our finances, Lord, and just help us be good stewards of our finances. In, in your Lord, we, in your name we pray, it. amen and amen.
Praise the Lord. Good to be in God's house every time. Amen. Um, so just bring, want to bring to you what's happening this week. Um, today we finished up our conversion uh, Sunday school class. And next week we're going to begin uh, church membership. The book says, the title is Church Membership, How the World Knows Who Represents Jesus. We have the books available in the back today. Depending how many want to get them, um, we may have to order more. Oh, they're all sold out. Okay. So if anyone here wants to get the book, please go to the back. We'll make a list. We'll order some more books. And I thought about this um, this morning. If you can attend the class for different reasons, still get the book. I would say read the book on your own because then we can always have conversations together, right? And I think it's really important that as a church we're all in sync with what we're teaching and what we're trying to help everyone understand. So of course we encourage you to come to the class, but if you can't come to the class, still get the book. Okay, so go to the back if you didn't get it today and we will order that book for you and we'll hopefully have it next Sunday. Tomorrow is our women's gathering. I know it was supposed to happen. Hopefully you saw the email. I think everyone did because I didn't hear anyone calling me. Sally, where are you? But we had to cancel Monday. We've had some different things going on in the family. I had to watch my grandchildren. So we rescheduled it for this Monday at 7 p.m. Reminder, ladies, don't bring any food. We will have a few things for you that the ladies that help set up will provide. But we just want to make it simpler. We don't want everyone worrying about bringing something. We want to make it easy, too, as we we all have work the next day, so don't worry about bringing food. We'll have a little something for you if you're hungry. But um, this Monday at 7 p.m., we're going to finish up on talking about being holy, being set apart. And I think it kind of even just goes with what we're talking about today, being a witness. The Holy Spirit in our lives transforms us, so we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. And then Wednesday is uh, prayer service, the second and fourth Sunday, so next Sunday is our life groups again. And um, there's a kids' zone meeting on April 21st. Mark your calendar for April 21st because we have two things happening that day. We have the kids' zone meeting right after service. That's going to be for anyone who is currently helping with kids' zone or if you have an interest in helping with kids' zone. And please, if, if you are someone who's following Jesus, we, we really need help. We are short. We don't have enough to help with watching the toddlers, with watching the children um, for, you know, um, I think it's from kindergarten through fifth grade. And um, we also have some other things coming up that we're going to have for our older children. So we really need help. So please, we ask you to come to that meeting if you can help out in those ministries and listen to that, uh, what we're going to be talking about. And all parents, we ask the parents to come as well. So that meeting is on the 21st. And then also at 5 p.m. is our annual business meeting. So it is a little bit of a few things going on that day. We promise to keep things concise and not drag anything out. So um, everyone that's a member of the church, please be at the annual business meeting at 5 p.m. on the 21st. And with that being said, I pray you all have a blessed day, and uh, we'll see you.